you are bound to start eliminating these so-called behaviors because you are stepping up your game. You are listening to The Alzheimer's Podcast with Mike Good of Togetherness, your number one resource for practical tips and insights, empowering you and your family to live well with Alzheimer's. Hello and welcome to episode 15 of The Alzheimer's Podcast. I'm Mike Good of Together in this. Thank you for joining me for another podcast where my goal is always to empower you to maintain a positive experience, reduce and eliminate the need for medications, and make your time together with those you care for the best it can be. Today, Christy Turner, the founder of DementiaSherpa.com, joins us for a conversation about resolving behaviors without medications. It's all too common to hear caregivers talk about how their loved one acts and behaves differently than they would have in the past, and how they, the caregiver, are struggling to cope with these behavioral changes. From exiting the home when we don't want them to, to becoming combative, the list of undesirable behaviors can be quite long. And unfortunately, due to a lack of education and training, people tend to label these actions and the individuals with terms that have a negative connotation. And often, caregivers turn to the use of medications to resolve the individual's behavior. But what causes these undesirable behaviors, and what can you do to resolve them without the use of medications? This is one of the most, if not the most, in my opinion, important topic we need to discuss in dementia care. And that's why I've asked Christy Turner, the Dementia Sherpa, to join us for this conversation to share insights and strategies. Christy Turner is a certified dementia practitioner, certified dementia care unit manager, and cognitive stimulation instructor. She has run award-winning memory care communities and assisted living and skilled nursing levels of care. And utilizing her 16 years of experience in working with over 1,100 people living with dementia and their families, she's developed a system that helps families move from crisis management to confidence. Christy helps her clients stop losing precious time to stress, worry, and arguments and start feeling joy again. And very importantly for this conversation, she is an expert in creatively managing behaviors without drugs. Hello, Christy, and welcome to the show. Hi, Mike. Thank you so much for having me on, and hello to your listeners. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, you're very welcome. It's an honor to have you join us. As you know, I've we recently met. I don't know, it's been about six or eight months from now, and um, I have learned so much from you. It's a pleasure. Oh, well, thank you. I, I really love collaborating with you. Yeah, well, thank you. So would you mind just sharing with our listeners, can you elaborate on what we mean by behaviors? And, and do people living with dementia always get to a point in the disease process where they have behaviors? Those are great questions, Mike. I'm so glad you asked. Number one, um, the whole behavior thing is such a pejorative term, which you were referring to earlier. Really, when we say behaviors, what we're talking about is communication. And so when we think as as care partners, when we're thinking, oh, it's a behavior, what we're really meaning is they're communicating with us in a way I'm not really enjoying right now. <laughs> so, you know, if somebody's, um, you know, swinging out at you or kicking or, or, you know, yelling an obscenity, of course, you're not going to enjoy it, but they're just really trying to communicate their needs. So that's one thing. The other thing is, does it always happen? No, it doesn't. There's so many myths and misperceptions out there. And so we end up thinking like, well, this is just part of it. This always happens. So I think a more accurate way to think of it, Mike, is instead of behaviors, think about its communication and then realize it doesn't have to happen. So it really goes back to how we communicate with our person, right? So if if we're better at figuring out what their needs are, at anticipating those needs and meeting them, then they won't have to try so hard to get our attention and communicate their needs to us. For example, let's say that I'm helping my grandpa uh, pull on a shirt, okay? 
and he starts swinging at me. The first thing I want to do is stop. The second thing is figure out what could be causing that. So did I surprise him? Did I not explain to him what I was trying to do? Or is there pain from like an old shoulder injury? Or does he have bursitis? Or, you know, those types of things. Or maybe he just hasn't been awake long enough. He's, he's, his brain is still warming up. So when we kind of take more of the detective role, then we mm -hmm. can think differently about that word behaviors. That's a really, really good point. And I think it kind of, it goes to the fact that we always hear that how communication in just general is a small amount of it's verbal. And a majority of communication is through body language and facial expression. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Christy, can you explain why you hate the word behaviors? And is there a word you prefer to use instead? Yeah, exactly what I was saying, Mike, is because behaviors sounds so pejorative. And what we're really talking about is communication. And words shape the way that we think about things, right? So I don't know if you've ever picked up on it, but I always say people living with dementia. I never say demented, right? Correct, or correct. something like that. Because person, it's a person first and foremost, and the dementia comes after that. So I do think language is so important. And because behaviors has such a negative connotation, really call it what it is, which is communication. It is communication that we may not enjoy, but the whole point of it is to get our attention and to express an unmet need. So I, I prefer communication. True. And for our listeners, I'll provide a resource that, that goes into um, using different language that's more positive and less of a negative connotation. Use of that language is, starts with us as the experts and, and leaders changing how we talk about it so the general public learns to, to have a different language as well. It really does, and I understand why it's difficult, too, because... On the one hand, we do want to use positive language. On the other hand, as experts trying to reach people who need our help, we want to use language that they use so that we're showing up in their search terms when sure. they're Googling trying to find the information. So there is kind of that, that fine line there. And the other piece is this is such a highly emotional time for any uh, family member, right? Yes. And I, I say that as someone who's worked with over 1,100 people living with dementia, but seven of them in my own family. Wow. So I, I, too, am a family member. I understand there are days when it just feels soul-crushing. It breaks your heart. And so we, we kind of you know, end up trying to straddle that line of using positive language, but also recognizing and validating the fact that family members don't necessarily feel positive, you know, aren't true. really seeing uh, an upside. True, true. And, and, and what we really want to, one of the things we really want to do is avoid just putting a label on somebody or something, a behavior, and then and not getting to the root cause of that, that issue. Right, because that's really what it's all about, right? We want to resolve whatever the underlying issue is. What do you, you know, you've, you've worked with over 1,100 people, which is incredible. You've, you've worked in memory care um, communities. And, and so what is the most common behavior or problem that people come to you about? I would say arguing is right up there. That's, that's probably way up there. Driving would be another one. And we don't, again, we don't think of that necessarily as a behavior, but that goes back to arguments, having arguments about, uh, about driving. And then just kind of little day-to-day -day stuff that doesn't necessarily get all the headlines when we're talking about dementia generally. You know, usually when we're talking about dementia and so-called behaviors, then we end up uh, talking about uh, so-called sundowning. Mm -hmm, right? right. And so those are the kind of the headline grabbing things. But often it's the the smaller day to day things like he's just he just doesn't want to do anything. He just sits there like a 
a bump on a log on the couch right. or how do I get her to eat because she's just completely uninterested. And then showering, of course, is always a big one. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it just, all of it, I always see it all comes back to communication. Right. And so every family and every situation is so different. Every day is, pro- is different. When you talk about being argumentative and the driving, what came to my mind was both of those often it might what I've seen tend from us trying to um, restrict a person's independence. They're used to doing things on their own. They're used to do going into this part of the house or going out in the yard or, or jumping in the car. And we're trying to protect them and keep them safe. And we so we can restrain them and they're fighting back for their independence. Do you agree? Absolutely. I agree. Absolutely. I agree. I always ask families to think of it this way. Uh, for example, if I, you know, because usually, let's face it, families don't need to know me if everything's going well, right? Right. right. Um, so I meet them when they're not having their best day. They're not having their best experience. <laughs> so a lot of times uh, it's a crisis point. And often, like when home care is involved, for example, a family will hire a home care company and say, you know, dad stinks so bad that he has got to get in the shower and we can't make it happen. So we're going to hire a professional to make it happen. And so the person from the home care comes in and 15 minutes later, the family's like, well, is he clean now? <laughs> Did you get it done? Well, no. <laughs> and there's a reason for that because if you're, if we're thinking that way, we're thinking of a task, right? Right. Dad has to get clean. Dad has to take a shower or dad can't drive anymore. Whatever the task thing is, instead of thinking of dad as a human being who has made it however many decades mm-hmm. functioning just fine and is now at a point where he needs some assistance, but assistance should never come at the cost of dignity. Right. And so, and again, that's why I'm always bringing the person as the focus at the forefront because every person deserves to live with dignity, deserves to be treated in every interaction with respect, kindness, love, for us to have compassion and to show empathy to what's happening for them right now. And, you know, just like anyone else, that requires building some rapport first Mm -hmm. before we make the ask. The other thing is, um, well, I know you're a West Coaster now, Mike, but you didn't grow up on the West Coast. I did. On the West Coast in particular, we are all about the automobile. So that particular issue is always going to be a big deal. And that really signifies independence. And for anybody, even if you had, let's say, a knee replacement surgery, right? All of a sudden, needing assistance to stand up, needing assistance to use the bathroom, it's a very humbling experience. Even when you are clear that your body just can't pull off at this particular moment what it used to. Now imagine having a disease like dementia that is attacking your entire brain. You may not even realize that you're impaired. Your body can't pull off what you want it to pull off. And you have people that you love or that you raised that are trying to tell you, you can't do this. And don't you remember? Well, you know, that's a recipe for disaster, right? (laughs) (laughs) Right, right. I have a couple articles and on helping maintain that dignity while helping them feel successful. You talk about how we have an agenda. We want to get things done. We're task oriented. And, right. and we, we're used to getting those done quickly and on our time. And I had a webinar a couple years back with a lady where we talked about the caregiver agenda and how you have to learn to let that be flexible and not be so task oriented. I'll put the, a link to that in my resource notes as well so that people can check it out. But it's so important to to go with the flow more, right? And work with the care recipient. Absolutely. And so I I tell family members, like, whether you're the type of person that's a free spirit, everything's cool and groovy, go with the flow, that's awesome. You're going to really need that. Or if you're the type A, get it done, 
I was a Girl Scout. Of course, I've got a plan type person. Awesome. You're really going to need that because you need to roll out in every day with a plan. Yes. But also total flexibility that, uh, you know, as my dad always said, have a plan, work your plan. Don't plan the results because you don't know what's going to happen, right? right? And at the end of it, this is a person you love. Right. And I, that is the main thing. True. This is a person you love. So get in the moment with them, be connected with them, and everything will ultimately work out. And it's going to work out better if you maintain that connection throughout any task you're trying to do rather than seeing somebody as representing a list of five things that need to happen and and in their own timetable it's it's a definitely a growth experience for care partners it really is that's a very challenging situation and but by doing so and giving yourself credit when you're successful and and cutting yourself some slack when you maybe fail in your own eyes is key to in my opinion, to to moving forward and helping them stay um, active and eliminating or reducing those behaviors. Yeah, you bring up a good point, Mike, because a lot of uh, care partners don't realize this. And it goes back to what you were saying earlier about how we communicate it and so little of it being verbal. It's Mm -hmm. really about our body language, our facial expressions and the energy that we bring. And that is absolutely contagious. I mean, seriously, ask anybody who has ever worked in memory care. They will swear to you energy is contagious. We don't tend to think about it like that. But an example is, let's say Thanksgiving dinner. You pray you don't end up stuck between Uncle Crazy Pants <laughs> and Aunt Busybody, right? Because, oh my gosh, they're, they're just... Ugh. You don't like how you feel by the time that's over. You might feel like you need a shower, right? Take that and contrast it to how you feel when you're hanging out with your best friend. True. You feel good. Right. It's the good stuff. And so that works for people living with dementia. I would say even more so because they're not necessarily concerned with, uh, you know, your haircut or the shoes you're wearing (laughs) or they don't care. It's a very visceral reaction. Do I like how I feel when that person is around me or do I not? I have to share. I have to kick my wife out of the house before I la- launch this podcast because she comes on her way out to go to work. She comes through like a tornado, grabbing all her stuff and kind of in a hurry. And that energy gets me a little uptight because I'm trying to be relaxed and chill, you know, as I, right. so, <laughs> so I, I plan, but, but that same energy, the caregiver can carry through the house. And as they're trying to get all these tasks done, their loved one will pick up on those. And that can definitely lead to these behaviors. And I mentioned in the beginning, and you've touched on a lot of them. There's so many different ways that a loved one can, or they communicate with us and, you know, calling it behaviors. But how do you help care partners? resolve these or you know get through these um, different situations so it, it, number one it depends on whatever the particular situation is but the first thing that I always do is start with giving the care partner the good news and the bad news and so the good news is you know this can change mm. the bad news is you care partner are the thing that's going to have to change. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, because if we just, if we, if we think about it, really the care partner is the one who does not have any brain damage. The problem that I see a lot is that we think of dementia. We hear dementia. We think memory loss, which is definitely a huge part of it. The other thing though, is it affects the whole brain. This is brain damage across the brain, which means it's going to affect virtually everything else that's going on. So if the person living with dementia could change, they would. They can't. Number two, having that recognition that, you know, they're doing what makes sense to them in the moment. The same way any of us, you know, if we go back and look at any action we've ever taken, good or bad, why did you do it? Well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. And then number three, 
comes really down to that whole approach piece. So I always, you know, there's the physical piece, and we talked about the energetic piece, which is very important. The physical piece is understanding, again, how dementia affects the whole brain. So, for example, it affects peripheral vision. It affects hearing. Or hearing is very highly correlated with dementia, too. So typically, somebody living with dementia is going to have poor vision, uh, definitely poor peripheral vision, and poor hearing. So we want to approach from the front so they can see that we're coming. We want to get their attention before we start touching them or um, asking them, you know, to take off their clothes for a shower or to change their clothes or whatever it may be. We want to get at eye level or below as a sign of respect. Nobody likes to be towered over. We want to speak concisely and clearly. And we want to repeat ourselves exactly if they didn't catch what we were saying the first time. Uh, my natural speech pattern is pretty quick. I, I just, and then especially like if I'm with my sister, I talk, you know, I'm just a mile a minute, right? Boom, 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 boom. When I'm working with a person living with dementia, I sound more like I came from the South. Mm -hmm. Right. I have a slower cadence. And I've seen many professionals who grew up in the South have really good success with that because that natural speech pattern is more relaxed and slower. So we just want to make sure that somebody is hanging with us as we're in an interaction with them. Then let's say the goal is a shower, for example. So rather than saying, would you like to take a shower, which is probably going to get you a solid no. <laughs> right. <laughs> Instead of that, how about let's look at first things first, right? Depending on where someone is in the disease process, the first thing we might want to do is help them stand up. Right. When you think about take a shower, that's actually a complicated process. And again, depending on where someone is in the disease process, we don't want to lose them along the way. So let's stand up. Now I'm going to put a little gentle pressure in the lower back to propel forward. Again, mm -hmm. gentle pressure. I'm not shoving anybody, but I'm helping them get the idea we're moving forward. And I'm probably holding hands or have my arm around them to, uh, to assist with that, too. We're headed in the same direction. Well, look at that. Here we are in the bathroom. Let's go ahead and get cleaned up. Cleaned up is a phrase that works well for men. Freshen up is a phrase that works well for women. Okay. Again, I'm not saying shower, and I am also open to the possibility that there are other ways to get clean besides getting in a shower. There's no rinse soap. There's no rinse shampoo. There's a soapy washcloth. There's lots of different ways to go about this, but notice at no point have I said, would you like to do something that I already know you don't want to do? I haven't asked that question. And that's where a lot of times care partners get sucked into that cycle of arguing because they know the answer is going to be no. When they hear the no, now they're kind of annoyed because good gravy, this still needs to happen. It's not going to happen. And now we are in an, another argument. So, well, come on, you really need it. So then, you know, we kind of jump in using reason and logic. Well, you know, you smell or it's been a long time or no, you just think you took a shower, but you really didn't. If reason and logic worked, we wouldn't have a problem, right? True. The thing is, reason and logic is part of executive function, and it's one of the first parts of the brain that's affected. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is using reason and logic because it's worked for us all these many years, and we're using it on somebody who absolutely cannot use it anymore. And the more they show us that reason and logic does not make sense to them, the more we, perversely, double down on it. Let me use more words so I can convince you this needs to happen. <laughs> and that just doesn't work. So that's what I'm talking about. We need to kind of think outside the box. We need to approach it differently. And we need to just really aim for keeping that cool and groovy vibe throughout the whole thing. You know what? If it's not going to work right now, no great shakes. Walk away. It's going to happen. It's just not right now, okay? And, and again, there are other ways to get clean. So those 
things may sound simple, but that process, as I, as I just described, makes a dramatic difference. I've seen it thousands upon thousands of times. It makes a dramatic difference in how we approach what's happening. The other piece, pass all that, let's say all that's great, and you're seeing a so-called behavior. What's going on? Is there pain? You know, could pain be involved? Is somebody suffering from low blood sugar? Mm-hmm. You know, the joke in my family, because we all have low blood sugar problems, is when my blood sugar is low, everybody else around me is being cranky <laughs> because <laughs> nobody can do anything right at that point, right? It's it, What do they call it now? Hangry? I'm getting hangry. Oh, no. So make sure the, the uh, blood sugar is where it needs to be. Make sure you're offering snacks and, and uh, something to drink. You know, a quick tip about uh, offering fluids is don't, again, don't ask. Set it down in front of someone. Set down a glass of water. Here, this is for you. A lot of that is, you mentioned how the care partner, the caregiver must change. And I'm listening to what you're sharing. And yeah, it sounds simple. And, and it, it, I can see how it would work. But boy, it sure isn't intuitive to the, you know. And, and that's the problem, I believe, that we're not trained as caregivers. We're bombarded by how devastating and this disease is and how it takes away so many abilities it's beyond memory, as you mentioned. And we're just not equipped to handle it. I think, right, people don't go to school. Right. For, you know, <laughs> that this isn't something that they're, you know, teach math, science, English, whatever, but they're not talking about aging or uh, caring for somebody. Uh, right, exactly. And then a lot of training programs, for, even for, you know, professional caregivers, um, are not ideal. They're not uh, terribly involved. And I think that I'm able to talk about and explain things in a way that probably sounds like I really have been through this thousands of times <laughs> because I have. So that's why I don't, and I don't want people to feel like, oh my gosh, I could never get there because I promise you absolutely can. Mm-hmm. I, again, I've worked with thousands of families too. What it takes, number one, the commitment, you know, to do it. Right, right. And number two, you know what? When it comes to dementia, it's going to give you opportunity after opportunity to practice. And. <laughs> Practice does not make perfect. Practice makes better. Mm, I like that. Anything that you keep trying to do, you just keep going forward. You keep going forward because as you know, day after day happens no matter what you're doing with it. So if you just make the decision that you're going to approach it differently and you're going to practice, you are bound to to get better. You are bound to start having better days. You are bound to start eliminating these so-called behaviors because you are stepping up your game. There's a Japanese concept. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but the idea is improving by 1% day after day. Think about how many days it takes to get where you need to go. (laughs) In the grand scheme of things, not that long, right? Right. So Small steps. yeah, absolutely. And and reach out because, you know, a, as you show, um, you know, with your website, with your podcast and, you know, I, I, I don't have a podcast, but I love to talk. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I have a website, too. There are professionals out there who are available to help, who are ready and waiting to help. And I know as a care partner, it can feel isolating. It can feel like you're in it by yourself. And, uh, you know, you're not true. You, we're, we're together in this, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. There's, there is support out there. So ju- just reach out. Yes, absolutely. Great advice to our listeners. As we wrap up this episode, Christy, I know you have some incredible resources on your website. Would you like to mention any of those and share? And I'll provide links in the, the show notes for our listeners. Sure. So if you go to my website, that's DementiaSherpa.com, you'll see a beautiful homepage. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And you can just click uh, and get a download. There's a communication tips and strategies download for dementia care partners, which is going to go into more detail about the things I talked about. There is also a guide on how to manage 
hallucinations, delusions, high anxiety without drugs. And that has some scripts in it in real life scenarios. So you can kind of see if any of that relates to what's happening in your house and how you could use that. And then the third thing, and this is probably my favorite, is how to stop arguing. Mm. And so again, um, and, and that's a uh, a PDF uh, download, but it's a, from a slideshow. And so that has a, a lot of pictures and graphics, which is, I think, why I like it. But the concrete tips and steps that you can take to uh, start eliminating arguing forever, which honestly, you really can do. It is possible. So, yeah, DementiaSherpa.com, come there and, and grab the goodies. <laughs> and I'll tell our listeners, Christy's resources are are extraordinary they're great you need to you need to check them out they're better than most i highly recommend them and um oh, thank you. and again you'll find a link to those in the show notes at togetherinthis.com forward slash episode 15 so thank you christy for joining us and i'm gonna have to have you back <laughs> oh i would love to thank you so much 30 minutes is just never enough and and thank you to our listeners that was just that was a incredible conversation on on behaviors and um, how we can look at the, that as communication and, and try to get to the root cause and, and avoid them. This concludes our conversation on resolving behaviors without medications with Christy Turner, the Dementia Sherpa. Be sure to visit Christy's website and you'll find a link as well as all the reference resources in the show notes at togetherinthis.com forward slash episode 15. And to help support this podcast, please consider leaving a review and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Take care, and I look forward to talking with you in the next episode. Bye now. Bye. You've been listening to The Alzheimer's Podcast with Mike Good of Togetherness. For more information and to get the resources mentioned in this episode, visit togetherinthis.com forward slash podcast. <laughs>